Welcome to Endless, a Sandman podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm writer, erstwhile DC Comics editor, and duplicitous dodo bird, Elisa Quitney. And I'm story expert and just another Wilkinson, Lonnie Diane Rich. Today on Endless, we're going to be talking about Sandman Volume 5, A Game of You, Chapter 4, Beginning to See the Light. Beginning to See the Light was written by Neil Gaiman, drawn by Sean McManus, lettered by Todd Klein, and colored by Danny Vazo. This issue was edited by Karen Berger, assisted by Elisa Quitney, cover by Dave McKean. Someone's watching us. Time to wake up. In beginning to see the light, Barbie braves cold hunger and an absence of toilet paper in her pretty child's fantasy of a princess dress as she and Prinidou, the jauntily caparisoned monkey, lose the green dodo bird, and Wilkinson, the cynical but steadfast rat, make their way to the Isle of Thorns and the Hierogram, which they hope they will recognize when they see it. There are moments of great sadness for Barbie and her compatriots, such as finding the dead body of the Tantablin. The dead courier was carrying a scroll that contained Polaroids of Barbie with her face painted, and Wild Kingdom type information about the European cuckoo. Once the alien chick hatches in the nest of its unwitting foster parents, the fledgling cuckoo throws out the unhatched eggs or fellow nestlings so it will flourish without competition. Its voice, we are told, has an almost hypnotic quality. Despite the hardships and the dangers from the Black Guard, Barbie finds a surprising sense of happiness in her quest. She bonds with her teammates, learning that Wilkinson was one of 17, all named Wilkinson. Barbie reveals that she was an only child, and the worst she can say of her upbringing was that it was unexciting. There is no lack of excitement in her life now, as the group enters the dreaded wood of tweeners, which claim Prinidou's life. Back in Dreaming Central, Lucienne shows Morpheus that a certain distant scary is still in existence, and the compact he made with it still stands. Nula, mousy and shy, braves the Dream Lord's displeasure by confessing that she did not merely observe Barbie, but warned her that bad stuff was going down. Morpheus dismisses Nula and walks away, then turns back to tell her she did the right thing. Nula is overcome with pleasure. Back in Manhattan, George's face will not shut up. First, George Face insists on calling Wanda a man. Then George Face insists that the moon and gods agree. Unreliable as George Face is as a narrator, he does know two things. Hazel, Foxglove, and Thessaly are walking the moon's road, and the weather is about to get very strange. Also, Barbie is in trouble. That's three things. Indeed, Barbie and her friends seem to have hit a dead end when Luz volunteers to fetch help from the Isle of Thorns. She returns with help, but not the help that Barbie and Wilkinson expected. Luz is a double agent, working for the cuckoo, and she watches Wilkinson die at the hands of the Black Guard without blinking an eye. Then Luz delivers Barbie to the Citadel, which turns out to be a small stucco house that looks just like Barbie's childhood home. All right, Elisa, so here we are, Game of You number four. We are definitely on the back nine for this particular story. Uh, What did you think about it? How do you feel about this issue? This issue is one that works on two levels for me. You know, first of all, it's a straightforward, shit is getting real part of the story. (laughs) And, you know, for Save the Catnicks, This is where we get the promise of the premise. So this is quest stuff. We get twists. We get moments of bravery. We get we have to bury our compatriot. And we also get, you know, the bonding and the revelations. That's the whole, you know, if if you're into the um, hero's journey, this is where allies are are made and cemented with, with new tests. But there's there's something else going on, too. I mean, this is point in the story where we get little clues that there's a second agenda to this and that Mm -hmm. this is also you know kind of a story about leaving your childhood self as you quest out in the world for who you're going to be and there, there are all these delicious little ways that we do get you know kind of author's message author's intention moments and I love it 
How how is it for you, oh new and fresh one to this journey? New and fresh reader. Um, yeah, like uh, for me, it has a very Alice in Wonderland kind of feel to it, which has never been one of my favorite stories. Um, so I think something about that, the the shifting nature of reality, which is what happens in dreams. The fact that they get the scroll from the Tantalin and then it's it's these pictures and then it changes into those pictures. And then at the end, you know, we go to see the cuckoo and it's her childhood home and there's all that. That's how dreams are. Dreams shift in reality. Dreams are about what everything means, not necessarily what it is. I think that's true, you know, in stories and dreams are stories, you know. So we move into this space where everything is kind of shifting. Um, I do love the quest, you know, storyline. I always think a quest is fun, you know, and the the Joseph Campbell of it is kind of an interesting sort of a perspective to take on it. I loved seeing Morpheus again, you know, um, all of that was really, really fun. And I did miss, you know, like Morpheus and, and the dreaming and all of that and his presence in what's going on here. So it was really fun to see that. But then we get to the second half of this one. In the beginning, it feels like, you know, we're just kind of wandering, we're doing this thing. And then we get to the second half and it gets dark. It gets dark. You know, we lose Prinidu, um, Luce is, betrays everybody. Wilkinson, which is heartbreaking, Wilkinson dies, you know, and Barbie is on her own having to continue on this journey. She's captured. But the one thing like I like at the end is that, you know, she's like, they probably think that I'm the one being led to slaughter, you know, but that's what they look like to me, you know. Um, and I always thought that, that was really, you know, kind of neat. Um, so it's, it's a a really interesting issue spending all of this time you know with Barbie we get a little bit of time with Wanda which is kind of where I want it to be like I wanted to see Wanda dealing with the talking face George you know and like all of that stuff but I, I thought it was I thought it was good it's interesting I'm very interested to see where it goes I was not expecting the darkness the severe darkness of that turn you know where we just like lose everybody it's like three two one boom it's just Barbie and she's on her own I think that's really interesting um so so yeah, like it's it's definitely I think one of those issues that when I have finished it and I know everything that happens and how this fits in with everything, I think I'll have a better feel for it. Right now I'm just following along. Like this is the road we're on, we're just going. Oh gosh, yes. So I have two responses to things you said. Um mm -hmm. you are such a, you know, a self-aware reader. And I, you know, I, whenever I, I start with an episode, I go back and I look at the Sandman companion, I look at the annotated Sandman. And so there's a part where Neil said, and I remembered after reading it, that he had said that to me as well, that there was a point where he thought, God, I miss Morpheus. This is not, you know, this is not Barbie and her pals. This is, this is the Sandman. And so he wanted to go into the Sandman's castle for himself and he but also yeah. with an awareness of the reader and so I think you're you're absolutely right on there the other thing I wanted to remark on is you talked about Alice in Wonderland and Alice in Wonderland I think works on two levels there's the child level of this adventure and quest that Alice is on and then there's a level of it's a satire of you know, what was then current society and um, and illogic and, and, you know, it works on other levels mm -hmm. as well. But I think there's a lot of elements of, of social satire in Alice in Wonderland. I think this has a double level too. And, you know, we can, I'm hoping we'll talk more about that. But I think it's not a level of social satire. Although, you know, there are moments that touch on that as well. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff. I think part of it is that because I don't have the whole story mm. yet, because I haven't gotten there, that there's some of this stuff that I feel like there's more here than I'm seeing because I don't have that whole context. I have a feeling when I'm done that a game of you is one of those things that the experience is going to benefit from knowing what's coming. That your first read through, you're just following you know, and figuring out where everything is going. But yeah, like I'm really, I'm really enjoying that. Let's go ahead and talk about the the cover art, of course, because we need to give, you know, our, our love to Dave McKean and all of the weird shit that he does on these covers that is really kind of interesting. We have another, now Game of You has been split covers where we've got one half with the title, A Game of You. Um, and then in this case, it's the top half um, imprinted over an image of a New York City cab. 
tab, which is really kind of fun for me because I'm looking at the rates on the side and I'm like, yeah, I bet those have changed. <laughs> um, the bottom half is warm shades of orange. Um, as a man holds an image of a bird, I mean, I'm presuming it's a cuckoo, but I don't know. As a scratched in speech bubble reads, cuckoo spell with a K. Um, and there's this shadowy, ghostly figure kind of swirling around him. And like, I, they're so... The thing about the McKean covers is that they are evocative in ways that dreams are evocative, right? You know, like the imagery itself is kind of secondary to how it feels. Like what's literally in the visuals of something, always with these Dave McKean covers, feels like it's secondary to like how it feels. And what this feels like is somebody like almost being taken over, you know, somebody mm. being... Um, possessed by this this dark evil spirit and you know and we're talking about like you know we've talked a little bit about the history of the cuckoo like what the cuckoo bird actually does which is something I never knew about um, how incredibly evil that nature is that takes over like they don't even raise their own kids they leave their kids to kill other baby birds like but it's okay so wait I just have to interrupt yeah. I don't know that you can call actual cuckoos evil because what they are just doing is what they have evolved to do. They, you know, right. like mm -hmm. is, is a leopard evil for killing a baby gazelle in order to feed its own babies? This is how cuckoos get by. And, <laughs> um, and I think that it's an interesting thing to think about. You know, obviously there's there's mm. – I believe the movie The Midwitch Cuckoo, or it was either the book or the movie The Midwitch Cuckoo, yeah. I should have looked this up, became <laughs> The Village of the Damned. So there were, um, I think this has been remade a bunch of time, that it's it's sort of a British um, a Muhara movie where there's all these identical looking blonde children. And you know, you know the one I mean? And that, so that whole idea of raising children who are not yours, um, not yours and who are in some way malevolent. It's it's a big horror idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I I want to sort of suggest to you that by including this cuckoo information, we also have to think, you know, are actual cuckoos actually evil any more than, I don't know, as, as Charlotte and Charlotte's Web says, am I evil because I wrap up, you know, the fly uh -huh. and I paralyze it? I mean, nobody's putting food in my trough. Well, no, you know what? Like, fair enough. Nature is cold. Like, there's some cold <laughs> shit going on in nature, and I get it, right? At the same time, the, the creativity of I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make this life, and instead of caring for it myself, right? I'm going to put it in a nest, have it kill the other babies. And then, and like, you know what they were saying is that the, the song of the cuckoo kind of, you know, possesses the parent, these birds to cuckoo. take care of the thing that killed their babies. Like, no, it, it, it does. It feels particularly, that's some particularly cold shit. Like, you know, a lion that kills a gazelle to eat, to survive, like that is the way that nature is is made. This feels uh, like a little more questionable. And I think that from a, you know, from a very like human perspective, which is what we do, we anthropomorphize the fuck out of everything, right? That shit is cold, man, you know? And so I, I absolutely honor your point. Is it evil? It's nature. It's just how this particular bird gets by while honoring that I like I say two things can be true at once yeah seems fucking <laughs> cracked to me like that is that is cold shit now and I'll I'll just mention since we're on we're in cloud cuckoo land um yes so you know the term cuckold for uh -huh. a man yes. who um has his his wife has as you know had sexual congress with another another man. Um, mm -hmm. That comes from the story of the cuckoo, because of course, in the days mm -hmm. before reliable birth control, if your wife went, you know, stooping somebody else, that also meant that you didn't know who the biological father of your children was. And so that that whole idea of the cuckoo and cuckolding and being a cuckold yeah. that all comes. That's that's all 
wrapped up in cuckoo-ness. It's interesting stuff. And I do kind of love that Neil pulled that in, you know, that reality. I mean, that truth about how the cuckoo, you know, exists in the world, pulled that into this story. And this, of course, is like the bad guy, you know, like in the story, this is the antagonist, this is the villain, right? Yeah. Um, or, and the cuckoo and the people who are pulled in to serve the cuckoo, you know, the George in the regular world and then in the dream world, you know, we've got the betrayal of Luce, you know, um, like all of that feels like they're kind of taken over. And so getting back to like the Dave McKean art, you know, we have this image of a person where the the cuckoo is, is the word is scratched in, in this kind of chicken scratch sort of, of writing. Um, and then you see that like ghostly vision vision flying like swirling around them like is that you know the cuckoo taking them over you know and controlling them um and that is that is something that i think is kind of like a really interesting evocation in that art and the speech balloon if i remember i don't have it in front of me doesn't it sort of go through the head so it's as if Mm -hmm. it's as if he it's not the man speaking but the bird speaking through him Mm-hmm. I think that's all so evocative. You know, I last night, um, I'm, I, I'm so thrilled to be part of your year of writing magically novel writing yes. course. And so I was thinking in our, our discovery uh, process of the course about doing collage because Jenny Cruzy, yeah. who I think was, you know, a big influence on both of us. Oh, absolutely. Was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, was a big collage artist and, and truly a collage artist as in her discovery process. So I found a book <laughs> by my friend Holly Harrison about collage. Uh-huh. There's um, some of Jenny's artwork and an essay by Jenny. And then there's my mini essay called Why Elisa Hasn't Graduated Collage about my <laughs> incapability of, of doing collage. Yeah. I think I ended up, every time I tried to do a collage, it looked like one of those um, – you know, insane person plotting to kill someone, magazine, you know, <laughs> pastiche things. But I yeah. I want to try again. There's something about Dave McKean's collage covers and mm-hmm. the way you can see symbols and motifs. And I mean, he's doing it from a different angle, but it, it really makes me want to experiment with that. But it's, you yeah. know, it's, I think, probably... We need to do a bunch. If you if you try to do one good thing and you've never done it, then you know it's probably easier to do a bunch right. for for fun. Yeah. No, the value of collage um, in the discovery work, and for anybody out there who's not a writer, discovery is that phase where you're kind of like figuring out what your story is going to be, who your character is going to be, all that kind of stuff. And I learned from Jenny directly. Like we collaborated on a novel uh, called Dogs and Goddesses, and she, of course, made this unbelievable. Like I, you know, was in the the house at the time that she was doing this, and she like created from foam core like a, an actual 3d step temple you know and then like put all of the stuff in, and it was so beautiful and like my collages tend to be like for me it's it's not the outcome that the collage is good it's the in the process of creating it you are like accessing you know these spaces and and visually playing in that space which i i struggle with visuals so much in my writing um and jenny who is an amazing artist as well as an incredible writer um, really helped me, you know, kind of like figure all that out and access it. It's something I still resist in every book to this day, um, but that has always, always been helpful. So now I'm, of course, teaching it in this class, you know. (laughs) How about, you know, at some point, how about I make you write a a page or two as a comic book script? Oh, my goodness. Yes, that'd be really fun. And then that'd be really fun. That'd be such a great experience. Just as part of Mm -hmm. Discovery. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think that sounds really fun. I forget that we're not just talking. We, we have, we've we've gotten a little bit off topic. Yes. But anyway, all of that, you know, to be said, like the collage work, again, like the collage work and the way that Dave McKean puts his stuff together, it is very much like so evocative, so incredibly visual and evocative of a feeling rather than necessarily something literal from the story, you know, and that's something that I always kind of appreciate because when I sit down with a Dave McKean cover, it's never like, oh yeah, you know, there's Sandman doing his thing. It's always, who is that? 
What is that? What is this thing? Like there are more questions that that come from Dave McKean's covers than answers. And to me, it's like working with, um, you know, kind of this fictional, magical Rorschach test. What I see in it, it may be different from what you see in it. What I see in it, knowing nothing about what's going to happen. What you see in it, knowing all of this stuff about how this works and having worked personally with Dave McKean and all of that. It's such an interesting thing. And that's kind of why I love spending the time that we spend on the cover art, because there is so much um, to, to like get us leaning into the art and figuring out what we see there. I love it. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot of fun, you know, thinking about collage and symbols. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was also thinking a lot about all of these fairy tale and quest elements in, in this storyline. And it got me thinking about, you know, the symbols of fairy tales. So I, I, I kind of delved back into Bruno Bettelheim, whose book, The Uses of Enchantment, uh, Bettelheim was a psychologist who wrote about taking fairy tales seriously back in the 1970s when that was not a thing. And here's a quote that I thought was really interesting that, the, well, I'll paraphrase it, the tragedy of much child psychology is that the findings are correct for an adult taking a look back at childhood mm -hmm. and that it's very different when you're thinking of it from a child's perspective and that quests and fairy tales mean something different to children. And then I found this wonderful uh, little essay by Adam Phillips from The Guardian mm -hmm. newspaper uh, in 2009. And he's talking about quests. There is a formative period in everyone's life when it begins to dawn on us that we can't get everything we want from the family. The one thing the family cannot prepare you for is life outside the family. The quest is always to find out if there is a place elsewhere that has something else you want. Anyway, so he, he goes on and talks about these quests, and it, it made me think about the nature of a fairy tale quest and that sudden burst of happiness that Barbie feels in the midst of all of this drama. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, we have this, like, rare moment of lightness. You know, if you think about like the quest stories that you usually see, right? It is a descent into greater and greater and greater darkness. And one of the things, you know, in storytelling is like you're always escalating, right? You're always making it worse. You're always making it harder. And one of the things that I absolutely loved about the way that this quest moves is that we start in darkness. We start in cold and freezing and snow and misery. And then we get this this kind of respite, right? Where, you know, Barbie wakes up and it's sunny and she said, I didn't think I'd ever be warm again. And mm -hmm. she's warm and she says, I'm happy. I've, you know, because she knows that she is pursuing something that she is supposed to pursue, right? You know, I mean, you figure that like, because she is fulfilling a purpose, right? That she is feeling that happiness. Um, and I, I kind of love that because even though in the moment, it is something that's better. It is a moment of lightness, right? What is the worst thing when you're in a dark place, but having just experienced that you can remember what it was like to feel good and to feel happy. And that contrast in and of itself does make it worse when we go into this dark place yeah. again, that like we had this moment of happiness. It wasn't all torment. There was fun. There was joy, you know? Um, and that's one of the things that I, I love about this particular issue is that that is that turn of the knife that sometimes by making things better, you can't the light moment before the dark moment. I mean, come on, that's genius. Absolutely. And and the whole thing mm -hmm. of fictional reversal, you know, you you, mm -hmm. you know, that whole idea you go from something that ends in a positive, you know, sense to to a negative uh, so that you 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 don't just go from positive to positive or negative to negative. You have to escalate or you have to reverse it. I was also thinking, though, about, you know, when I think about types of fairy tales, you know, you got your talking animals, you got your displaced princess. Uh, there's not so many princess on a quest stories that I know of. I mm -hmm. mean, there's the Snow Queen. Well, she's not a princess, but uh, what's her name? What's her name in the, the girl in the Snow Queen? In the Snow Queen? I don't know. Oh, so, you know, she's there. There's these two childhood friends, a boy and a girl, and he gets that weird 
chip of demon glass in his eye and everything looks bad and he runs off to live with the snow queen and so his childhood friend the girl goes looking for him that that oh yeah i don't remember that yeah i don't think i've read that one it's a, it's a cool and strange one and it's kind of like the archetypal keep pursuing that guy that is treating you really badly and run <laughs> off with another woman story it ends well for her but you, you just wish she would stay with the – they describe her as a gypsy girl. Of course, that term is not uh, – I, I yeah. don't know what I would call her. Um, was she of the ROM? Anyway, uh, so there's there's that. There's East of the Sun and West of the Moon, which is very similar to Cupid and Psyche. Other than that, I don't really know a lot of girl goes off on a quest stories – Mm-hmm. But I think what, what gets a little blended here is that World War II band of resistance, you know, a girl who's sort of an ordinary girl doing traditionally feminine things and then suddenly joins the cause and is fighting. Um, mm-hmm. And it's funny because that narrative I keep seeing now in terms of Ukraine where there's this, you know, sad yeah. stories of – you know, grade school teachers and, you know, young women who had no intention of joining the army going off and having this very different experience. And so I think blending the fairy tale, the World War II elements, Mm -hmm. I mean, Wilkinson is a very World War II film. Yes. Mm -hmm. I I don't think... He kind of has that archetype to him, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think people watch World War II stuff the way we used to because it was... I realize Mm -hmm. this is the thing that freaked me out Okay, yeah. so World War II was as far from us in our childhoods as the 90s yeah. is now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's freaky. It's I mean, absolutely so when freaky. we were little kids, you know, and there was World War II stuff, it would be like watching something set in the 90s now? It's basically the first season of Friends. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, from when from when you and I were born. Yeah. And there's a, there's an American <laughs> Girl doll, a historical American Girl mm-hmm. doll set in the 90s. I just I want you to know that that freaks yeah, me no, out. Yeah, no, that's it's it's just wrong. Like I don't know what's wrong with people. That's just wrong. That's not okay. Um but yeah, like but the world has changed so much so quickly like in our lifetime i think the world has probably changed more uh than it has in the lifetime of any human prior to us um in the last like hundred years i think the world has changed so much more i thought that was what my grandparents lived through i used to think that their world because if you think about it Mm -hmm. i mean my grandparents who grew up in little towns in russia you know had a much more traditional you know you milk the cow you light the taper, you, you know, I don't know, you know, everything right. was made, many, you know, hardly anything was bought. So I thought they had lived mm-hmm. through the biggest transition. I think even, yeah, there's a lot of transition, like it's been speeding up as we go. But I think our lifetime, you have to think about when we were born, we could still kind of see into the old world from where we were. But then communications happened. Um, and everything like there was more information available, the internet happened which I think is hugely transformative. Of course, I'll be long dead before all of the scholar work is done on exactly how much change there is. Um, but I think that we've been through like a tremendous, a tremendous amount of change. Um, and so I find that really interesting. And to get back to like your quest thing, um, it was funny. I just saw something and I couldn't find it to quote it and to absolutely be sure. But I just saw something that somebody was doing an analysis of Joseph Campbell, you know, in the hero's journey, which yeah. is classic um, Mm quest-based kind of mythology that Joseph Campbell looked into. Um, and, And he had said that women were not part of that women couldn't it couldn't be a heroine's journey it was always a hero's journey it was always about the men and all of that kind of stuff and i don't know you know that i'm sure that's out there somewhere i think i saw the actual quote but um regardless like that's nonsense women can also have quest journeys it's just that usually a lot of these stories are not told with women playing that role women are usually the prize at the end of the journey if they're anything you know or they help and they support and they nurture you know, and I think that, you know, some people have done versions of the heroine's journey that mm-hmm. includes Absolutely. some different um, stepping stones. But my take on that uh, is that females can take yeah. a hero's journey. Females mm-hmm. can also take a heroine's journey, what, you know, which has some I, – I, I don't have that one as internalized as well. 
But I'm sure that males can also have a heroine's journey as well yeah. as a hero's journey. I think we have gotten, I mean, the great thing about what where we've come since the 90s is I think things were more gendered. I, I remember yes. there, there was this, I love, there, there's things like the 16 hero and heroine archetypes uh, mm-hmm. by Tammy Cowder, Cowper, someone Lefevre. I Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. I, I've used them over the years, but then I had this moment where I thought, okay, so there's a hero archetype of a swashbuckler, mm-hmm. and the equivalent for that from the female might be the spunky kid or the free spirit, but that idea of a swashbuckler, someone who lives for physical extreme adventure, wasn't given in the heroine's journey, and I'm thinking, but we all know women who are that. You know, we, yeah, we, yeah. there, there are, you know, there are females and, and they, you know, I say females just because I don't know, girls, women, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that we, when we don't create categories, then we think it's impossible and it makes the person who is that feel like right. such an outcast, which kind of brings us back to a game of you and that mm-hmm. whole, you know, wonderful title. This is, this is a quest for identity. I mean, they're not really hierogram and all of that. What Barbie is really looking for is who am I and what did I do with my childhood imagination? I seem to have put it in a box and forgotten it somewhere while I went and lived, Mm -hmm. you know, this very blonde life. (laughs) This extremely blonde life. Absolutely. Um, No, I think that that's really interesting, too, because we get the the paper, like the um, parchment from the Tantoblin that is that is um, recovered is our images of Barbie, but they're shifting images of Barbie, you know, and shifting sense of self. And I think that that's a really wonderful, um, you know, uh, kind of metaphor moving through her quest. And then, of course, her quest ends at her childhood home where she's going back into herself, you know, and I don't know who the cuckoo is going to be. The cuckoo is a woman. Um, And is the cuckoo going to be somebody that we know? Is it going to be Barbie's mom? Is it going to be a version of Barbie that is battling, that is an internal battle? I mean, I don't know. I'll find out as we read more. But I do find it really interesting. We also kind of break from all of that to have this interaction with Wanda and George, right? You know, it's 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 tough. It's a tough couple of pages, Uh, not just because George is a skinned and bleeding face on a wall, though that is definitely part of it. Um, but George keeps telling Wanda that she's not a woman and gets into some troubling bioessentialism with the chromosome talk and saying that the gods agree with that, which I would argue is not necessarily true. But one thing that I really did like about this, as disturbing as all of that was, is that Wanda does not let him tell her who she is. Like, you know, it is a fact that trans people have to fight and fight all the time to have their space and just to be safe in the world. You know, um, it's got to be exhausting. Right. And when I engage with fiction, when I think about it from the perspective of marginalized identities that I'm part of, um, when I engage with fiction that depicts misogyny and sexism as they are, it is frustrating because I know the reality of those experiences. But on the same hand, it's also validating because we're looking at it as long as the text knows it's bullshit. You you know, and the text doesn't like double down and say this is absolutely correct in the way it should be. It feels like a de-gaslighting thing. Like I've had this experience and the text is telling me I was right to not think that this was okay, to not think that I deserve to be treated this way. And here, what I'm reading in the text is that the text is backing Wanda's play, that all of this stuff, you know, from Thessaly and this idea that George is saying that the gods would agree uh, that Wanda is not a woman. Um, I feel like the text is calling bullshit on that. And I appreciate that. You oh, know? oh, completely. So I so I found a quote from Neil. Um, mm-hmm. Gods are not in a privileged position in the universe of the endless. They have opinions, but Wanda's position is as valid as any god's, and I'm on her side. So that was, Mm -hmm. but again, in the end, you know, authors can tell us, you know, J.K. Rowling has become famous for saying, actually, Dumbledore was gay, you know, and, uh, but it's Mm -hmm. not so much in the text. But I was thinking, if you look at Season of Mists, Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself thinking that the gods are on some different level from fallen angels, downright demons, or fairies? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, they they, yeah. they really are. All of them are presented as heads of state with, with mm-hmm. their own agendas. And as none of them 
completely pure and and you don't necessarily get the sense that one is more spiritually evolved. I mean, Loki is a god and, you know, and so is Thor, who's presented as this crass lout. And so, (laughs) so, you know, I don't think that in this world of the text of the Sandman, forgetting what Neil has said, gods are not presented as nobler or writer about such things. Yes. And Mm -hmm. in a sense, I mean, I know the endless are not gods, but they are also, you know, since they're presented as older than the gods, they have even more clout and you can't Mm -hmm. trust what they say. They are not, I mean, you wouldn't say desires, you know, particularly evolved or spiritually right. So, Mm -hmm. so this idea that, you know, if the gods think it, it must be so, is I think not in the text here, what I think you've got is gods stand in just as people, as characters. It's as if Mm -hmm. being supernatural in the Sandman universe would be a bit like being famous. So, you know, we all all fall prey to like, ooh, famous woman told me she uses this soap or eyeshadow, so it must be good. (laughs) But really, um, you know, does famous Mm -hmm. person really know anything more than anyone else. And so yes, okay, I'm going to I'm going to say it. I read uh gods and demons and such as basically like celebrities in in I the Sandman universe. I love that read. <laughs> I love that read cuz they're just as fallible as anybody else, if not more so, because they don't have to deal with some of the challenges that everybody else has to deal with that, that um, you know, keep us in line, right? They keep us learning and struggling. You know, sometimes there isn't as much struggle. And then that can make you, I think, sometimes your view of everything even more suspect, you know? Um, yeah. With the one uh, exception, I will say there's one exception. There is one character in all of Sandman who is more spiritually evolved than anyone else. Aha! Uh-huh. And who would you say that is? You know who. <laughs> Do I? Yeah, think I about mean, my it. First, uh, well, but are we talking about the, the gods, the pantheon? Or are we talking about anybody in the thing? Anybody, anybody. Who is the most spiritually evolved? Who is never selfish or petty or... I mean, my first thought is Lucienne. Oh, I hadn't thought, but that is true. Oh, yeah, that valid, valid. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking of death. Death. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah, because death is connected. Death is connected to humanity. Death is in service, and death knows that she is in service, and so that keeps her, I think, grounded. She is the least, the least self interested. The most, yeah. if if you were thinking of a god as being, you know, therefore more of, you know, like the Buddha, more spiritually yeah. evolved, I think that's, um, yeah, I would say death is, is. But it's not because she's a god. It's because she's who she is. Yes. Like, and that's the thing is that like, and one of the things that I like about that is that instead of outsourcing our morality, our belief system to gods who will tell us what to think. The Sandman universe says, figure it out for yourself. <laughs> you figure it out for yourself. Yeah. What do you think? Where are you on this? And who do you look at that you think you want to be aligned with? You know, do you want to be aligned with Thessaly or do you want to be aligned with Wanda? You know, Wanda's a hero in this story. And so I think that, like, I really, I like that. I, I, I got the feel from the story that Neil was on Wanda's side. I'm very glad that we have an actual quote uh, that Neil was on one to side, although I am I am very much for separating the author from the work that like an author's intent does not necessarily decide what a work means. Um, at the same time, I think that like an author's intent does show up and become readable within the text, you know, if they've if they've done a job, a good job with their clarity. And I feel like Neil has achieved some clarity in this. Um, and uh, and it's it's just, you know, it's it's a really, really fun um, story and game of you, I think, is incredibly challenging in that you really do need to read it. You need to actively make your own decisions about what you think about what's going on and figure it out from there. Which is one of the things I kind of like about all of Sandman, but I feel like Game of You is specifically, yes. um, you know, like that experience. Um, and I do love, you know, that we get to see Sandman. We get Morpheus, you know, dropping in. I've missed him. 
you know, uh, it was fun to see Nuala and this little kind of mini story that happens uh, in two pages. You know, they're keeping an eye on what's going on in the scary. Nuala's got this, you know, uh, concern that she's done something wrong that she didn't obey. She thought for herself. And then Morpheus says, you did the right thing. And I just, I love that. Now, I will say that if you look at how intense her reaction is, it's done yeah. all through the art. It's a very intense yeah. reaction. And I remember noticing it when I first saw this issue and thinking, that's a pretty strong reaction. Did Sean mm -hmm. overdo it a little? And then you keep reading and you think, oh. <laughs> Well, I love, you know, that she was like, I didn't, I didn't obey. I thought for myself, right? And that, that, you know, Morpheus was going to be displeased with her for not following his instructions to a T for thinking for herself. But he says, you know, he's, he's acknowledges what happens, walks away and then comes back to tell her that you did the right thing. Maybe it wasn't what I told you to do, yeah. but you did the right thing. It shows both of them growing. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, the other thing in this that uh, that struck me really hard, like we had talked about the light moment, right, before the dark moment, but then the falling of the companions. I mean, we lost Martin Tenbones in the first issue, you know, but then it's Prinidu, then it's Luz, you know, to betrayal, then it's Wilkinson, right? And Wilkinson's death... Oh, my God, was a shot to the heart. Oh, I know. And Neil felt it, too. Mm -hmm. Now, I have you ever seen uh, the Americanization of Emily? I have not. Well, oh, it's a great movie. I think it's Patty Chayefsky. Uh, it's mm -hmm. James Garner as a pacifist character, cynical and pacifist mm -hmm. in World War II. And uh, Americanization uh, was a euphemism for what happened to British women uh, trying to avail themselves of some of the luxuries they'd been doing without for years and years that mm -hmm. the American GIs had. And um, anyway, I would say that Wilkinson reminds me of a James Garner character. You know how nowadays there's Natasha Leone and she's got mm -hmm. this particular tough goodness, tough, cynical yes, goodness. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. James Garner had his own version of that, that transmuted from role to role. So I just would say to anyone who's watching this, who thinks, as my son often says, like, oh, old movies, they're so old. You know, just yeah. watch watch you some James Garner, particularly the Americanization of Emily. Oh, interesting. That's going to go on my For list. some Wilkinson Our... vibes, for some, you know, sweet, cynical uh... Wilkinson vibes. <laughs> I'd love to get some Wilkinson vibes. All right, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back with Lucien's library. All right, we're back. And Elisa has some wonderful nuggets for us in Lucien's library. What you got for us this week? Elisa? I will feed you the nuggets. Um, <laughs> so... Okay, so the first is Secret Worlds. Neil wrote a note to himself uh, around this point in the storyline. Everyone has a secret world inside of them, which oh. he later said he suspected was kind of the point of this whole storyline. I think there are other points as well. Um, mm -hmm. Then there is a uh, Long Way to Tipperary, which Wilkinson sings. It's a long way to Tipperary. You know it? It's a long, I long love way. I too anyway. that he's singing as they're on this quest, too. He's such a wonderful character. So yeah. that's a World War I standard, um, which is, you know, going into that whole war movie tropes, which we've got a lot of here. Uh, there's the the... What is the storyline title, the, the chapter title here again? That's, I believe that was a Beginning jazz. Beginning to see the light. Beginning to see the light was a jazz standard mm -hmm. that, like a lot of things, was redone, I think, in the 80s as a sort of new wave song. So mm -hmm. you can you can get your little Game of You song list going. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that there are all of these little nuggets. At this point in the storyline, Karen had gotten some flack for use of the word dick in previous oh, issues. Uh -huh. uh, so I think we, we it gets called the male nasty thing uh, with mm -hmm. apologies because there's nothing nasty about a penis. You know, let us let us rejoice in all our parts in their in their 
working and you know it's but mm -hmm. uh but but yeah so obviously that was to replace dick uh <laughs> And then the word weirdzo, which, of course, had previously replaced bizarro, replaced the word hooker, as in Wanda would originally have said of Barbie, she doesn't treat me like a freak or a hooker. Interesting, because the weirdzo, because it had been kind of a bizarro stand in. Yes. Um, that's how I read it. You know, I read it in a consistent like kind of reading. So it's so weirdzo kind of became the the word to use when there was a word you couldn't use <laughs> i guess so which which is mm -hmm. sort of interesting and then i think about the word freak which is interesting i don't know it it had three meanings when i was young okay so the yeah. first was you know a freak as in you're freakish and strange the yes. second was um you're wild in a kind of approving way like oh she's a freak which had some you're sexual right. connotations and then of mm -hmm. course it was a dance mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Nobody. So just in case you are really young and you think you've invented sex or dirty dancing. <laughs> so there was a dance called the freak, you know, as in uh -huh. the let's do the freak. They're doing it anyway. If uh -huh. I don't, Did you ever do the freak? I don't think so. I remember Super Freak, the song by well, Rick James. That was but I don't different. know if that has anything to do with the dance. The dance, the freak involved standing as close as was humanly possible to your partner and gyrating. <laughs> I love it. It was awesome. frottage. Anyway, but um, so, yeah, so there's Wanda talking about, um, you know, she doesn't treat me like a freak or a hooker. We had to be careful. You know, we were we were not yet vertigo at this point in yeah. time. We were all the things that would become vertigo, but we were not branded right. as some separate entity. And uh, so there were there were some, you know, weird, weird bits of, of flack. But God, when you think about how how backward the 90s were, I keep thinking how <laughs> forward thinking Game of You is and was. Yeah. No, I mean, that's one of the things like I've been doing a lot of work with 90s uh, television. Like I did, you know, an entire um, podcast series on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, you know, my husband recently watched Friends. Which, if you go back into Friends, there's a lot of stuff in there that's just um, kind of wild. And things that you look back on and you're like, wow, that's not okay now, you know? Um, and I feel like it's good that we've come as far as we, we have. There's still, like, way more to go. We are generally, as a culture, um, learning a lot more about the ways in which we think about people, and we're processing out some of these old world ways of thinking that are, are very, like, you know, you think about how incredibly gendered things in the 90s were. And if you watch 90s, 90s television um, or even you know early aughts too is is it's this constant fear that you would see in male characters that the 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 constant fear was oh I may be gay like when Joey and Ross you know take a nap together and they wake up and they're all comfy and cozy and all that kind of stuff you know it's a sweet moment of masculine community and they turn it into this oh no I might be gay kind of panic you know and that was the joke itself so many times in the 90s you know that like the joke was well what if I'm gay well what if you are enjoy your life have a great time you know and and so it's so interesting to kind of see that so clearly now on the other side of it, whereas yeah. at the time when I was there in the 90s, the ways in which our, our thinking was so incredibly gendered was just an accepted, we weren't thinking critically about that. So I find that really interesting. In part because people didn't think bisexual was an option mm -hmm. that was just not yep. on the menu you could not order off the menu although yeah. so many guys i knew in college in the 80s were bisexual actively bisexual in college but it was considered mm -hmm. that that was not it was not a real thing it was just a thing that people did in college it's experimentation right <laughs> you know it's just like and so it's it's so interesting. And once you've lived long enough to see some f like major shifts in the ways in which we think, you know, as a culture, um, it gives you a little bit of perspective on some of these things. And like, you know, I look back at the, the stuff that people were doing during that time. I'm like, this was the world that you were in. You didn't know 
you know, like there's, and there's stuff like, I mean, I'll say there's stuff in my books that I look at and I'm like, oh, geez, boy, how I wish that I had known better at that time, but I didn't, you know? Um, and so we all are kind of, uh, everybody who creates things is reflecting that society back at itself, right? Every mm -hmm. creative piece of uh, yeah, every art, every everything, right? Reflects us back at ourselves. So the thing that we critique is not the creator, but it's us, you mm -hmm. know, as a culture. And I think that we need to remember that when we're looking back at these things from, the, when we're looking at Friends, when we're looking at Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when we're looking at a lot of these things that were products of their time, that we, the critique should not be on the creator. Creators who deliberately do shitty things things in their work you know like there are times where a creator that a creator that behaves a certain way out in the world um i think jk rowling is is experiencing some critique that is valid and and necessary you know but like for the work itself you know you're reflecting the culture that you're in back at itself and that's one of the things that i love so much about what i see in a game of you that neil did is reflecting how we could be better at ourselves. And I just, I, I love that the way that he approached this story and these issues has that deeply connected human perspective that kind of defies the culture in which it was written. Absolutely. And I want to say that one of the things that Neil does is he allows you to make connections. So drop in some mm -hmm. factual information about a cuckoo, leave that right. for you to connect. And in the same way, I think the reader is a collaborator with the writer in creating the work. Oh, absolutely. And therefore, yes. I will say that I think everyone who wants to read Harry Potter should read Harry Potter. If people want to go and buy themselves a shiny new copy of Harry Potter, do it because the work also belongs to you. And I think it's yeah. in a way I feel less comfortable with saying don't buy a Harry Potter book than I would say, well, don't go buy the wand and go to the amusement park if you want to hold back. But the book, <laughs> the book, I, the, that's just my personal take. And now I have to say one thing other as my own personal responsibility. We were talking about tattoos and ephemeral yes. tattoos. And I've since read an article that they're not quite yeah. as ephemeral. It depends on the person. And so somebody, I think, just on a whim got a, a chili pepper tattooed on them and it's two years later and still there is a chili pepper on their body. <laughs> and uh, it's just changed everything for me. I'm like, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to just going to continue drawing chessboards on my face. <laughs> I was passing by a um, a tattoo place. We were driving around when uh, when my kid was visiting at Christmas, and I was like, "Oh my god, I want to go and get a tattoo." And I'm like, "And I know exactly what I want. I want Matthew with the red balloon." There is something about Matthew with the red balloon that is to me such a symbol of um, knowing who you are and a symbol of hope. The the levitation of the red balloon. Okay, wait. Like, there's so much in there. Before mm -hmm. you do it. Yeah. Have you read um, Swamp Thing and Matt Cable? I have been told to read. I've been wanting to read Swamp Thing forever. So, I've okay. Heard it's In this case, yeah. not to read who Matthew was before he became a raven is a little like yeah. putting a picture of Daenerys on you without knowing how the story ends. <laughs> In this case, it's how the story begins. So maybe that's different. But I just. I will have to check that yeah, out. Just yeah. Just anyone who's wanting Matthew the Raven tattooed on them, just be sure to check out Swamp Thing, Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. You'll mm -hmm. be doing yourself a favor anyhow. But it's just, you know, I think you need a full disclosure of Matthew because he's, you know. He's he has, a complicated character, but I he has a past. Like regardless, you know, don't we all, regardless of where, but like there he is, like whatever his past is. Who he is as the Raven is is just a great, wonderful character. So yes. we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that all works out. But that is definitely the one thing that I'm like, I think that I could live with that. You know, and as and as I get older and there's less of my life ahead, I'm like, fuck it. Put whatever. Yeah. Like, have a tattoo. Like, you know, what's going to happen? But um, so I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm really sort of invested in that being the tattoo <laughs> have, that I get. You'll have like a longer and longer raven. <laughs> I will. I will, depending on what part of the body that goes on. Uh, shit gets saggy. That's all I have to say. All right. So, Elisa, what is your favorite page of art in this issue? Oh, you know, I was looking 
All the snowflaked pages. I have such a clear、oh. memory. So these were not done on computer. These were physical pages,、mm-hmm. and I don't know what whether it was just white out or some kind of、uh, paint. But I remember them being really flecked with white on top of the ink, and there was thing about the texture, and it was magical. And so、um, all of that snow,、uh, the art of that, just brings me back and. Takes me on the quest. Oh my god, I absolutely love that. Whenever you bring in these like evocative details, like the smell of cigarettes on the artwork, and all of these things that you know, when we've got these prints and and digital versions that we're looking at, would just be missed.、Um, I really love that. I think in one of these episodes, I just want to sit and talk with you about the entire process because、uh, when I was visiting you and Karen Berger was there, you had this big、um, you know book that like. Had the actual size of the art and all of that stuff, and it had your notes that you had written on it, which is such an amazing thing.、Um, and I just kind of want to like revisit the not just the story, but the experience of what it was doing all of that work. So I love when you bring in those those little elements, those little story elements. It would include、okay. where's the artwork? It was, it was here. <laughs> Tom Pyre, <laughs> calm down. Let's see if it slipped down the back of the flat, you know, file folder. There it is, and the artwork and would slip in behind, and I would have a complete heart attack. Oh my god, I can't even imagine. Because losing art like that, I mean, that's losing a lot.、That's... Was art ever actually lost? Oh、uh, yes, beard lost. No,、oh, no, art had been lost, and it was my goal. As far as I recall, I never lost anything that I didn't find. But I'm sure an artist is about to tell me you're wrong, Elisa. <laughs> so have at me. Well, you can you can find us on Twitter. Definitely let us know.、Uh, for me, I think like my favorite art in this is the、uh, the page when Barbie wakes up. The sun、mm. is shining. We're having our our light moment before the dark moment. Wilkinson is picking apples from the tree. Um, I love that contrast, and in the moment, it felt like a nice,、um, you know, kind of rest from the the increasing gloom and doom of this quest.、Um, and then to get to the end where there's more gloom and doom, just I love that that contrast of flavors, you know, in the story there, which I think is just incredible.、Um, what's your favorite part of the story? The Morpheus Nula moment. <laughs> I.、Yes. I have to tell that, and Barbie realizing she's finally happy. I know、yeah. that's a weird moment to have be my favorite moment, but、mm-hmm. it'll make sense later. <laughs> I have to say I love that too, and I think part of it was like I love the moment. I love that it's a, a tiny little story of its own. You know, it has a beginning, middle, and end. We have a crisis for Nuala that is resolved at the end, and so I really, really like that.、Um, and part of it is just that I love revisiting and seeing Morpheus again, and seeing the dreaming, and seeing Lucien, and all of that. Like for me, it's just fun to to every now and again touch ground, you know, again with Morpheus, and that this is where all of this is happening. So yeah. I love that. If you enjoyed this discussion and would like to join in, Patreon supporters can chat with us and each other through our Patreon Discord channel. To find out how you can support Chipperish Media, visit Patreon.com/Chipperish. Other ways to show your support: write a great review on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends about the show, or wish in one hand, shit in the other. See which fills up first. This episode of Endless was edited by Chipperish content editor Jack Cram. Jack, you're smiling this morning. That's not something I expected to see in a hurry. Thanks so much for joining us. We will be back next time with a game of you, Chapter Five, Over the Sea to Sky. Until then, go in, Barbie. She's waiting for you.